good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in Delhi, uh, first time in over a year, uh, and a privilege to give this final keynote speech at, at Tech India. The American comedian Jerry Seinfeld once observed, it's amazing that the amount of news that happens in the world every day almost always just exactly fits the newspaper. Today, it doesn't fit. There is more information, more readily available, more immediately, in more formats, on more devices, and to many hundreds of millions more people than ever before. The news is being democratized. It used to be said that the freedom of the press is limited to those who own one. Today, anyone with an internet connection and a Twitter account can make the news. If you choose, the powers that be are you. The lines between newsmakers and news takers have been blurred. The people formerly known as the audience, the readers, the consumers, may now be the sources, the fact checkers, and the opinion makers. The basic principle of broadcasting, namely that there are transmitters and there are receivers, has been transformed by social media. For anyone interested in reporting the world they live in, the means of finding stories, of telling, of telling stories, the mechanisms for sharing stories, have all become infinitely bigger and better. We are living in the most exciting time for journalism since the advent of television, and the internet age has only just begun. Check the clicker. Just let me check the clicker. Yeah. Sure. Where do I point it? There we go. Right, so gone too many forward now. One second. I'm way too far forward. It is, it's going back now. Sorry, jump forward. Okay. There we go. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. BBC News has embarked on a wide-ranging examination of this changing landscape, the trends in technology and media, and what they mean for journalism. We've called the project Future of News. I'd like to share a short video that gives you an idea of what it's about. at the kosher supermarket. They arrive like a walking bed. Anybody that tells you they, they, they think they know, of course, is, is making it up. A newspaper dropping in your doorway. That's not going to be natural behavior anymore. Or perhaps even sitting down and watching TV. In the Commons, Mr. McLeod has said that the London busman's big claim is to go to the industrial court without delay. monopoly on having the ability to take ideas and broadcast in the world is now gone because anyone can. News channels brand themselves on breaking the news first and the rest of it and they don't. Uh, and actually if you want breaking news, if you want in-depth, if you want specialist news, the internet and the web is so much better. new technology, wearables, for example, have not changed our behavior yet, but it's not unreasonable to imagine that they will. And when they do, we're going to have to apply and adapt to those naturally occurring behaviors. The entire industry is implementing or integrating other features to understand its environment. <coughs> for example, sensors, um, be it physical sensors or sensors that detect motion, for example. The exciting thing is that there are new tools on the horizon that in many ways, it's a golden era for journalism. One thing we like to say is that virtual reality is the last medium. 
I think in many ways this is the future of news, but not completely. So there's a moment, that's aha moment. So with Hurricane Katrina, you're on the edge of a rooftop and you're sitting there and you're scared and it's raining and the water's coming up and this helicopter comes by and it says, we can't help you, it flies away. And that really puts the consumer in the moment and, and puts you inside of the space. This is a server rack which holds a series of cable boxes which records television news throughout the day. So everything that we record on a server rack you can see here on the individual TV screens. There needs to be some way in order to automatically decide for you or to help filter out all the things that you don't want to watch and help you find what you do want to watch. And when you think about data, you just think about like rows and columns and, and people's eyes just glaze over. That's not very useful. But if we can think about data as a way of telling a story and frame it in the same way and visualize it in the same way, so we can look at it chronologically, we can do, we can do a timeline, we can do a timeline that moves, we can do something where we can see the bar charts changing. We in journals think that we know what the world needs to know, that we let news judge it. Well, the truth is, I think we have to go to communities and find out what their needs are find out what they will accomplish, and then and only then can we determine what tools we need to bring to bear to help them meet their needs. It's things that people are proud and interested in being talking and talking about in public. It can be like a great joke, it can be serious news, it can be kind of inspiring um, stories. The, the breaking of news it is no longer going to solely be the domain of news organizations. What has to be, though, is that role of journalism. Because in a world where everyone can report on news, <laughs> there is a lot of noise. And the journalist's role is now more important than ever to find the signal in all of that noise and help tell the story with the authority. The art and science of journalism is really, really important. The art and science are, if you like, uh, of being a custodian of information, of being a librarian, the uh, energy and hard work of human beings in sifting through all this information is still really, really important. Okay, so dissecting journalism is like analyzing a joke. It takes the fun out of it and misses the point. Whatever changes to come, the job of a journalist remains to find out what is really going on and report it. And we know there's no need to hurry the future. Radio remains unrivaled in its capacity to combine intelligence and intimacy. There is no more powerful or impactful medium for conveying the news than television. And in some countries, such as India, Newspapers are still flourishing. Even so, unmistakably, the big technological shifts towards faster connectivity, more computing power, ubiquitous data, and the rise of algorithms and machine learning are visibly changing the industry we work in. Yes, the pace of technological change is uneven between different parts of the world, different age groups, and different communities, but it's going to keep on coming. If anything, it will accelerate. The medium, as ever, shapes the message. Half a century ago, TV transformed the news. For millions, it brought it to life. But television also puts a premium on dramatic pictures, telegenic politicians, and snappy sound bites. The internet will also change the news. Indeed, it's already happening. The internet is bypassing the professional reporter. Computers can already do some of what journalists used to. For example, compile the cricket results, produce travel bulletins, and write up company result stories. People in power are finding that they can speak directly to the public without needing to bother with a reporter's awkward questions. The journalist's competitor is no longer just another journalist. Often, it's the subject of the story. In India, Nahendra Modri, Amitabh Bachchan, and And Mahindra have all shown in their own way how easy it is now to communicate directly with their audience. The internet age also produces real problems 
not just for the news business, but for the society it serves and the democracy it is supposed to enable. The digital media have democratized the means of production and distribution in news, but not necessarily the end result. We live in an age of growing information inequality. Millions of people use the internet every day, yet 60% of the world's population remains unconnected. The world is dividing into those who seek the news and a growing number of people who just skim it. Some people search for news, others wait for the news to find them, and some people just don't want to know. To simplify, the information gap between younger people, poorer people, and groups on one hand, and older people and richer people is widening. Around the world, there remains a digital divide between those who can access the internet and those who cannot. There is ever more data, more opinion, more freedom of expression, but it's sometimes harder to know what's really going on. Even though people say it's easier to get the news, they are increasingly unsure of the facts and unclear what they mean. When it comes to the detail, people don't necessarily feel better informed. They may feel disinformed, partially informed, or ill-informed. Given the proliferation of paid news, online rubermongering, internet trolls, PR spin, content farms that regurgitate without regard for provenance or property, not to mention advertising that dishonestly masquerades as independent journalism, ad fraud, inflated online metrics, and it's easy to agree with Tim Berners-Lee that the internet today is rife with bad information. This is an uneven age. We see in places sagging enthusiasm for democracy, polarization of opinion, disengagement from society, and at times a crisis of citizenship. These problems are not the fault of the news media, but journalism, particularly the kind of public service journalism that is at the heart of the BBC's mission, has a responsibility to address them. The news industry can help determine the kind of connected society we are. In the interests of democracy and our industry, the digital age requires the news industry to rethink the way it will keep everyone informed. So how should news organizations respond to this rapidly changing world? By extension, what does this new landscape imply for media owners, advertisers, and marketers of all kinds? I can give you a glimpse of what this future might look like by telling a little bit about what BBC News is doing. <coughs> the BBC has a publicly declared ambition to double our cross-platform international reach to 500 million people a week by the year 2020. News will continue to account for the lion's share of that audience, and much of the growth will come via digital platforms. As you can see from the screen, BBC News' global audience is growing steadily, driven in part by worldwide interest in major news events, when audiences turn to the BBC for up-to-date and reliable reporting. In January, following the attacks on the offices of Charlie Hebdo in Paris, our global digital audience in English and other languages, hit a new record of more than 70 million weekly users. In fact, the BBC can claim to be the leader in global breaking news. With our 24-hour newsroom in London, an extensive network of bureau and correspondents around the world, we break more stories from more countries than any other international news organization. On Twitter, BBC Breaking is one of the largest news brands with 14 million followers. And it has the most engaged audience. According to independent studies, the BBC is the most retweeted news publisher on Twitter. Sorry, it's too many. Beg your pardon. But while the World Wide Web is global, increasingly news is personal. In India, BBC News is the top international news site and BBC World News Television reaches around 32 million households. But we provide English-speaking Indian audiences with a localized homepage for BBC.com, which curates the breadth of BBC output to serve their interests and tastes, not just in news, but in factual genres like BBC Earth. BBC News is also growing on digital platforms in local languages. BBC Hindi, as you may know, started on shortwave radio and still today reaches 5.5 million listeners on that platform. But its online traffic 
has increased 140% this year to reach 5.5 million monthly unique browsers in February. The BBC, in English and Hindi, is also one of the first news publishers to join the Facebook-led internet.org initiative to connect low-income mobile users to the internet, which has recently launched in India. <coughs> mobile, you might say, is the trend that is driving all the other trends in digital today. More than half of BBC's online traffic comes via mobile and tablets already, and we expect that trend to continue. All of our news websites have moved to a fully responsive code base, which means that the page automatically adapts to the screen the user has, whatever its size and the speed of their connection. Already in the UK, and later this year internationally, we will be launching a new app that allows you to personalize the news by choosing from which of thousands of topics you want to follow. And the app is where you can really see the desire for personalized news. It has more than 65,000 taggable topics already. And in the UK, in the first week since its launch, 1.8 million users have personalized their settings in, get this, 1.1 million unique combinations. Like all publishers, the BBC's focus is increasingly on reaching and engaging audiences via social networks. BBC News is the second most followed news brand on Facebook. Our BBC India page has 2 million likes. BBC Hindi has more than 3 million. And we've been at the forefront of finding new ways to reach mobile audiences via chat apps such as Line, Viber, and WhatsApp, including a project we did during the Indian election to provide updates in English and Hindi. We've found new ways of gathering news from the internet, including BBC trending and innovation in what we call social news gathering. Its tagline is, what's popular and why? By looking at the world through the lens of social media and using real-time analytics to pinpoint where the social conversation is at, our journalists find trending topics and then illuminate the particular cultural or political context that make them significant. While social media widens our distribution, new creative storytelling formats and the growing appetite for lean back consumption on tablet devices, often at weekends and evenings, are creating new opportunities for long form and explanatory journalism, as well as richer advertising formats. The best of our current affairs documentaries on TV and radio now have their counterpart online in long form multimedia templates that combine text, video and photography to create a more engrossing narrative. At the same time, our digital platforms are making better use of the medium in which a lot of the BBC's best journalism has traditionally been told, namely video. On the screen is the first public showing of a new video page that will be going live on BBC News website in a few weeks' time. Video traffic on BBC.com has risen 60% this year, and this scrolling page will drive that figure higher by making video easier to browse, watch, and share. So the, the way news is gathered, produced, distributed, and consumed is changing, and the pace of technological change shows no signs of slowing. The BBC, like other news organizations, will need to adapt to this disruption with new tools, formats, and ways of working in the field and in the newsroom. The BBC has always been an innovator in news, and the opportunities are plain to see. We believe it's time to spur our innovation again. The ability to source, represent, and make sense of large volumes of data will be vital. We see opportunities for experimentation and innovation with content, and we know we will need smarter ways of curating and managing both our own and other people's. We will need to find new ways of connecting with individuals and serving their specific needs, whilst also retaining an overview of what is most important and most interesting in our editorial judgment. All of this may mean redefining how we think of news so that we see it as a service comprising not just news stories, but also the relevant data, context, and information that people need delivered to fit into their lives. Technology will help provide answers to many of these challenges, but working at what that means and how to implement it in practice 
will be one of the biggest challenges of all over the coming years. Amid these changes, the BBC will need to remain clear about its principles. We will be uncompromising in our journalistic values of accuracy, impartiality, diversity of opinion, fair treatment of people in the news, and public service. Maintaining high levels of public trust in our journalism will remain as important as ever as we bring audiences the real story. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions, absolutely. I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions that people might have. Yes, sir. So uh, my question is, you are competing directly with the India media houses, Indian media houses, to generate, you know, new and fresh breaking content. Mm. So how are you taking care of that? That what is your reach into India in terms of content generation? Sure, um, it's an interesting question actually, because as I'm sure many people here know, the BBC has been present in India for decades. Um, you know, we began broadcasting on shortwave radio. Um, you know, several generations ago, frankly. Um, and even today we continue to do that, although we know that audience on shortwave is declining, as I've said. So clearly India has changed enormously since then, since, um, and the media has changed almost enormously since then, and so has the BBC. So we're in a world now where the Indian media market is very fast growing, very dynamic. There are lots of new international entrants like Huffington Post and Courts and many others you can name. And of course, Indian media houses are flourishing and doing really well. Um, and my response is that that's, that's only a good thing. You know, diversity of, of um, outputs, consumer choice, all those things are, are healthy um, and we welcome it. Um, but that doesn't mean there isn't a role for the BBC in this market like many other international markets. As I've said, our traffic in India is growing. BBC.com in English is up 25% year on year. BBC Hindi in digital is up 140% year on year. So um, there's clearly uh, people in India who, uh, amid all the choices that they have in front of them, still find that the BBC has something valuable to offer. And of course, as internet penetration, particularly on mobile phones, becomes more widespread, and we've talked about this several times at the conference, you can see the size of that audience and the potential reach to be, to be gained will grow. Um, now, we don't see the local media as competitors, necessarily. We see there's room for everybody in what is a growing market. Question here? Rakesh Bhatia from Innovative Solutions. In the digital world today, I was really amused to see the use of typewriter in the, in the uh, video that was played. One burning question that remains is the India's daughter. I don't know how you would like to address that in sure. this gathering today. Okay. Um, yes, I'm happy to, happy to speak to that. Uh, and I guess, you know, to the previous question, it shows that the BBC is still relevant in this in this market. We have, you know, um, things to say about India um, and, and and have an understanding of the country, which um, people still find interesting. I'll make a couple of a couple of points. The first one to say is BBC World News uh, will not show the documentary in India for the reason being that we do not own the rights. The rights to the documentary in India are owned by our friends at NDTV. So it's up to you know it's a question for them about whether it should be shown here. The second point I'd make is that editorially, uh, the BBC stands behind the documentary. Uh, we believe it absolutely conforms to editorial standards. We think it's a difficult subject, but, we've, but, it, but the documentary does a good job of explaining what was a uh, horrific incident that made headlines around the world uh, and some of the issues that relate to it. The third point I'd make is 
since I've arrived in Delhi two days ago, I probably lost count of the number of people who've told me they've seen the documentary. And I suppose that tells you something about you know, the internet age, that censorship isn't what, what it used to be. Um, the, the government can, for, for whatever reasons it may have, forbid the television stations to sh from broadcasting it, but people, if they're interested, will find a way to consume media on digital. So, so it's just a sign of how, I suppose, how India has changed, like many places, and how the internet is um, disrupting some of the conventional wisdom about how media is managed. I wish the documentary actually gave a sensitization. Yeah. Uh, I wish the documentary actually sensitized the people in India for what they should not be doing and what they should be doing, more than you know, exposing the content that the way it has been delivered. Okay. Um, that would have been actually yeah. a noble cause. Perhaps there would have been more viewerships, more discussions, more positive discussions. I would say. Okay. Um, I mean, you, you understand the, the documentary was made by an independent documentary maker. Um, lots of people have had an opinion on it. Um, clearly, it's uh, a documentary and a subject of intense interest. Um, I'll pass on your opinion if I meet anyone um, from, the, from the documentary team, anyone had to do, to do with it. Um, I think, yeah, you know, it's, I respect your opinion. I think it's... Um, I'm just glad that people have got have seen it and have got lots to say about it. Any further questions, ladies and gentlemen? Is censorship always bad? I mean to say that, that you have a complete region on boil at this point of time because it all started when censorship was defined. Is the question, is censorship always bad? Um, not always bad. I don't think you can make an absolute statement like that. All, all publishers have to operate within the law, clearly, and the law varies in different parts of the world, uh, and the BBC respects that. Um, but I would say, as a journalist, generally speaking, freedom of expression in the world's largest democracy is broadly a good thing. I would tend to that side of, that side of the argument. So who should actually be responsible for the limits to that expression? Um, that's a matter for India. I mean, I, mean, I don't want to get too drawn into this. Um, uh, it's, those are complex questions, um, and I think it's for different societies, different uh, regulatory regimes to decide that for themselves. Uh, I'm making a much more general point. In general, firstly, that censorship is harder to do in the internet age. That's just a fact. And secondly, as a, as a, a, a news organization like the BBC will broadly in general terms, be on the side of freedom of expression. Let people see and decide for themselves is probably, uh, in most cases, the, the, the approach we would advocate. On the internet age, what is your personal view uh, with respect to the speed versus vis-a-vis -vis the authenticity of the report that you are reporting? I'll so give you a couple of examples. Uh, today's train accident in India, today's train accident in India was first, I, on my Twitter feed came in, First from RT, it took almost two hours for BBC to report. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened when the uh, SIM card hacking thing from the GCHQ was reported. Again, RT was reporting it much faster than BBC. Yeah. I have yeah. no idea why it was a delay. But while you are talking about that you are in living in the inter -age, internet age, you are doing it really, really fast, you are not. You are practically yeah. waiting for the wire agencies to publish it and then you are following yeah. them up. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think I, the question, it's a very difficult balance that we try and strike editorially between speed, because we know that news travels faster on more platforms uh, more quickly on the one hand, versus uh, verification and getting the story absolutely right on the other hand. Um, now, um, we publish much more quickly than we used to do, uh, and you know, we know that people get um, news updates for the push alerts or through Twitter or whatever it is on their mobile phones all the time. And, um, you know, we've benchmarked ourselves and against other international news organizations, we think we're pretty fast. However, we are very careful because we really believe in uh, the trust in our brand as our, as our frankly, our, our kind of most distinctive brand quality. 
we, we go to great lengths to make sure that it's true. So, you know, we take checks. We don't just, re you know, repeat something because someone said it. We'll always make some, do some independent journalism to, to, to verify it. Um, and what, what's interesting, I suppose, is how much we've, we've learned in the newsroom about um, uh, how you can do it. So in particular, I'm thinking of, um, we've got various tools that allow us to mine social media, and we can find breaking alerts, or we can find um, information on social media which looks like breaking news, and that gives us a head start on checking it out and verifying it. So the days when you know, the news wires, for example, were the fastest way to spread the news definitely no longer apply. Um, there are lots of ways to find out what's going on, of which social media is a really important one. But we do always take care to you know, find out who that information came from, why they know it to be true, does it corroborate with anything else that anyone is saying, um, you know, is, it, uh, is there any, any reason why it shouldn't be published you know, in terms of responsibility or something. Um, and, and we try and walk that line. You know, um, and I think it's changing all the time. Um, but if you look at BBC Breaking on Twitter, you know, it does have, as I said earlier, 14 million followers, which tells you something. And it's also the most retweeted brand on Twitter, news brand on Twitter. Why is it the most retweeted? Because people believe it. They trust it. If it comes from the BBC, it's very likely to be true. And therefore, they feel confident to share it with their social network. Uh, and I think that's extremely valuable for us. And we're, um, we will guard it all the time. Any final question, ladies and gentlemen? One more, yes. Could we have the mic, please? What's your thought on uh, citizen journalism and user-generated news content, typically for the market like India, where the geography is huge and 70% uh, of the population is youth, 2 million people coming out of college every year. Mm -hmm. So is BBC thinking about something in that direction? Because we remember that the BBC radio, due to the INB guidelines, was taken off air. Yeah. Yeah. So any thoughts on uh, using the youth of the country as citizen journalists? Sure. So um, citizen journalism means different things. If you're talking about... Um, members of the public who might become correspondents or something, that's one thing. But the area that we find most interesting and are really um, starting, to do, starting to change our journalism the most, I think, is this idea of social news gathering. So, um, yes, of course, you can't beat eyewitness reporting and sending a correspondent to the scene to really find out what's going on. That still remains important. But increasingly, we can find out quite a lot about what's happening by listening to social media and exploring it quite actively. So I mentioned earlier BBC Trending. Uh, they've become very good at finding a trending topic and then adding some value journalistic, journalistically in terms of why is this interesting, what does this tell you, why would it be trending in this particular moment in this particular country, and, and what is it about that particular cultural or political or social setting that makes it news. Um, and we, see, we do more and more of that kind of news um, and we find that audiences respond to it really well as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we call it a wrap to the session, our final session for Attic 2015. Let's have a huge round of applause for Mr. James Montgomery. And thank you so much.